could I offer a very warm welcome to all the webinar, uh, which is entitled uh, Countering Extremism in the Age of Pandemic, Why We Mustn't Take Our Eye Off the Ball. Um, uh, can I say how delighted we are to be joined by His Excellency the Ambassador uh, of the UAE to the United Kingdom, uh, His Excellency Mansour uh, Mansu Abahu. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us and you'll be saying a word at the end. Um, but before I introduce our guests, could I just run through uh, a bit of the, the logistics? Um, uh, each of our panelists will speak for uh, anything up to uh, about 10 minutes, uh, and then we will have a question and answer session. If you'd be good enough to put your Q and A's in the chat, uh, I think many people will be uh, quite familiar with Zoom now. You'll know where the chat is uh, on the more button uh, on your uh, on your panel. So if you would put uh, your questions in then, uh, then we can have them at the end of the sessions of each of uh, at this, uh, after everyone has uh, has spoken. Uh, so do keep those questions coming. Uh, in the meantime. Uh, can I introduce and kick off? Um, we're delighted to welcome uh, His Excellency Minister Omar Saif Gobash from the UAE. Uh, uh, Minister Gobash is well known, I think, to members of the, uh, of the society, a distinguished background, uh, not only in ministry and diplomacy, but also uh, as an author, particularly well known for his book Letters to a Young Muslim, which is particularly pertinent for us today as it described growing up uh, as a young Muslim in the contemporary world with many of the threats and challenges that are out there. And the book received great plaudits uh, and uh, not least uh, with uh, uh, Minister Gobash's uh, personal story and encounters with terrorism in, in the past as a particular view and uh, awareness of the issues affecting us all. And uh, Minister, we're very pleased to welcome you today. Um, our second speaker will be Sir John Jenkins who needs very little introduction, I suspect, to many members uh, of the audience today. Uh, a very distinguished uh, Arabist uh, ambassador in a variety of places from Consul General in Jerusalem uh, to Syria, uh, to Libya and to Saudi Arabia, but also heavily involved in the issues of countering extremism uh, and the author of the paper on the Muslim Brotherhood, the Policy Review and the Muslim Brotherhood instituted by David Cameron's government um, and uh, Sir John is well known in these circles and uh, has a forensic attitude to the issues which are raised by modern extremism. And our third speaker uh, is a great friend of mine from Parliament, uh, Lord Walney, uh, known to many of us as John Woodcock, uh, who uh, worked exceptionally hard in Parliament and had first experience of dealing with extremism uh, in the United Kingdom as he piloted his way through the Labour Party's difficulties of the recent past. John is now the United Kingdom's government's independent advisor on political violence and disruption. And we're very pleased to welcome you, I think, to your first time to the Emirates Society, John. So thank you very much for joining us. I think the background to this is perfectly clear. Um, we've found throughout history that, that those who mean to disrupt us, extremists of all sorts, will use any opportunity and take any uh, opportunity in order to do so. Uh, and the recent pandemic plainly is no, um, uh, is no exception to that. Accordingly, as the world thinks about the influences of the pandemic and how to counter it, other threats uh, are all around us and may of course be increased. Uh, and that I think we know from continuing to follow the news. Uh, so how difficult is it out there? What advantage is being taken at the moment? Why is it necessary for us to be constantly on guard? What is happening at the moment and how best can be advised? So we have three excellent distinguished speakers who will look at it from their own context and be able to bring us absolutely up to date. So may I invite uh, His Excellency Minister Omar Gabash to give us an introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alistair. Uh, it's really great to be back with you uh, all again. Uh, and it's great to see uh, uh, John, John Jenkins. Uh, it's been uh, some time. Um, I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, on this subject, uh, we've, we've really not spent too much time in the office uh, for the last year. So it's been uh, interesting to observe the world. Um, there, the way, the way we've approached the issue of, of terrorism uh, has been that obviously we fight it wherever we can. Um, 
Um, but what we recognized in the Emirates was that there was a, a, a very, very powerful um, uh, narrative uh, within our own Islamic community that was pulling kids into war zones and into acts of violence. Uh, this uh, recognition took place quite quite some time ago. Um, around, the, I mean, the 1990s was already a time when we, we, we knew about it. Um, and then uh, after September 11th, uh, this kind of got became much much clearer to us. I think what we've tried to do over the last uh, two decades is to focus in on what young people in particular, um, uh, what aspirations they have, and how uh, we as a government can. Um, provide them with the means to actually uh, achieve those aspirations. And you know, when I was uh, growing up in the Emirates in the 1970s, 1980s, um, it, the future was quite bleak, even though we were a very wealthy society. Um, there wasn't a tremendous amount um, for us to think about or to do. Uh, and it was quite easy to fall into um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the charm of uh, extremist uh, thinking. Um, we also had, you know, all the, all the different wars going on. We had um, the Af Afghan, uh, the situation in Afghanistan, which was putting a lot of people into it, including one of my, my uh, distant cousins, um, who then uh, actually lost his life, uh, lost his life in, in Afghanistan as a as a mujahid. Um, and then there was uh, the, uh, the the other the other situation of the revolution in Iran. Uh, of course, that kind of polarized uh, the Islamic community into two different um, uh, groups. Uh, and we all became very, very aware of being either Sunni or Shia. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to say that at least in the Emirates, that is now uh, not really an issue at all. Um, but uh, the Emirates has continued, uh, I think, especially over the last few years, uh, to develop uh, a, a kind of a sensitivity to what young people actually want to do, what they can do. Um, and we've created a number of opportunities with um, the the economy in the Emirates is actually much uh, much richer, much deeper, much broader uh, than it is in, in say other countries. Um, the uh, approach of the leadership is not uh, ha to hand out sort of goodies to to different groups, um, but it's rather to invest in uh, the intellectual infrastructure, the legal infrastructure, uh, the physical infrastructure, uh, and to provide um, uh, uplifting visions of where the uh, country can go. Um, and you know, so on, the, on that note, I think it's really important that um, we marked uh, the successful launch of our um, probe to Mars, um, which uh, the, the idea of that was not to um, reinvent the wheel or, or, or try to prove that we are you know, a, a nation of brilliant scientists, but that we could um, put together a team in cooperation with others around the world uh, and put together a probe that would, would contribute perhaps to understanding global problems uh, and solving those global problems. I think that is something for the Arab world, for the Muslim world, is an important um, example of uh, how we could approach the world rather than trying to be exclusive as Muslims and exclusive of the, as Arabs, to say that actually we have um, partnerships with people all over the world, uh, no matter what religion or culture, um, and that we can work together to improve the loss of mankind as opposed to just uh, our own kind of uh, neighborhood. Um, I think I'll, I'll, if that's okay, Alistair, I'll leave it at that um, and look forward to the questions if possible. Uh, okay, Your Excellency, thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, that is opening from your perspective, perspective of the UAE and how you're seeking to counter it. Um, Sir John, uh, your sense yes, of where we are at the moment and uh, what risks are out there, particularly uh, in an age where we have been affected by another existential threat. Yeah, thanks. Sir. I mean, the, the, the billing is um, uh, extremism in an age of, uh, of COVID. Um, I mean, I tend to think it's extremism in an age of insanity, quite honestly. Um, uh, and I think one of the I mean, we don't know how we're going to come, how collectively we're going to come out of this 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 pandemic. Um, there will be changes. How significant they'll be, I think nobody knows. Um, I think for me, the danger is that it it distracts our attention from from these sort of issues and weakens the ability of governments and societies um, to deal with them and to address them uh, honestly and intelligently. If you look. Um, uh, you know, and, and a lot of the discourse at the moment in in this extremism space is about um, uh, is about the balance between 
uh, what people have regarded as a traditional threat from uh, from Islamist extremism, violent Islamist extremism, uh, versus uh, so-called uh, right, uh, far right, uh, uh, white supremacist um, uh, extremism. And I think that was something <clears throat> that was crystallized for a lot of people by the the events uh, in Washington in January, uh, the attempted to the so-called invasion of the capital, and so forth. And I think people are still trying to work out what this means. And you see this in the way that that that, that, that uh, police officers, security officials, and so forth will talk about the threat um, uh, now. Uh, and a lot of people will will say, you know, the real growing threat is uh, is is right wing white supremacist extremism. I am highly skeptical of that. I mean, if you look at the figures, uh, it still represents uh, a very small proportion uh, of the total. A uh, number of cases being dealt with by police and security authorities, certainly in this country, uh, in Europe. I think the United States is slightly different, um, but that's not so much because uh, white supremacism uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a bigger threat there, but because it's not, Islamist extremism uh, has tended to pose uh, a less uh, immediate threat to the, uh, to the homeland. If you look around uh, the world at what's happened to uh, organizations like uh, Al-Qaeda uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Daesh, uh, they've certainly been weakened. You know, you, 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 we, we've seen a degrading of the capacity of, uh, of both uh, movements to exercise some sort of central control. Uh, for Al Qaeda, uh, there are. Uh, uh, this is partly because of the contest that they have had with the Islamic State, but also because of the the actions uh, that state authorities in the region and outside it have taken to combat them. I mean, there, was, there were reports that uh, Ayman al Zawahiri. Uh, may not be with us anymore, uh, which would be a, a, a great loss. Not um, uh, 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 his uh, his 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 longstanding deputy Sevil Adil is in uh, is in uh, uh, Iran, um, where uh, one of his colleagues, of course, Abu Mohammed al Masri, was uh, was recently assassinated, uh, which I thought would be an embarrassment to the authorities in Tehran, but they seem to not be embarrassed by it at all. Um, uh, and in uh, in northern Syria, where uh, where they have traditionally been strong, um, they have been uh, in the form of a Haras uh, They have been uh, uh, outflanked by by Tahrir al Hashem and Abu Mohammed al Jilani, who recently, for those people who are watching uh, public broadcasting in the United States, uh, had an interview dressed in a suit uh, with an American journalist, which is an extraordinary thing to do. Um, <laughs> So they have actually been 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 uh, central control has been degraded. Uh, so I think you know the immediate threat to the far abroad, which is all the core, the thing that concerned Western governments, um, uh, has gone down. That's not been because of COVID; it's been, been because of action against them and because of their own internal disputes. But they still exist. Um, uh, the Islamic State have been conducting uh, operations in Iraq. Uh, uh, only yesterday they conducted a, 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 a vehicle-borne uh, um, um, uh, attack. In Ambar, uh, there was a, a, a major attack in Baghdad a couple of weeks ago. So they retain capability. Uh, their horizons have become more limited, but they're still there. Um, and I think uh, more generally, um, and it's, it's a point that, that Armo was talking about, about what governments do uh, to create the opportunities, um, uh, the social opportunities uh, for people um, to, uh, to, uh, to not simply to discourage them from, from, from taking this sort of path, but to give them some sort of perspective for the future. And I think that's, 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 that's globally, the appeal of the ideology remains uh, strong for various complex reasons uh, with certain people. I mean, I'm, I'm, it, it's, it's a relatively small number of people globally, but, but, in, but in terms of what you can do with the numbers, it, it, it remains significant. And I think that's something that governments the governments uh, need to continue uh, to focus on because it has not gone away. The second thing I, was, is also a point uh, that uh, that draws on something that Omar said about the the, the Iranian Revolution in um, uh, uh, in uh, in seventy nine. Major uh, threats um, to the Middle East, um, uh, what I call the Great Levant is the spread of uh, militias of, of, of Islamist militia uh, who have a degree of loyalty not to Iran, but to the Supreme leader. They're Khomeinist militias, basically. Uh, they are, which is what Hezbollah means. They are Fechat al Emin. They, they, they follow the line of the Emin. Um, and I think you know, we see this We see this with Hezbollah in Lebanon. We see it in, in, in Syria. We see it extraordinarily in, 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 uh, in Iraq. Um, only uh, uh, 
10 days or so ago there was a, there was a major rocket attack on the on the airbase at uh, uh, on the airport at Erbil, carried out by probably by two of these militias, Kateb Saida Shahade and Kateb Hezbollah, both of whom uh, are essentially controlled by the uh, by the IRGC. Um, uh, and this th this this hollowing out of state capacity in large parts of the Middle East, in favour of these predatory militias, I think is a major major long-term threat. Militias form part of a, of, a, of, a, of a network structure that preys on the resources of states, prevents them becoming proper states, and links them into global criminality. And I think one of the things uh, we're looking ahead for the next you know, 25 years is this nexus between uh, ideologically inspired, violently, violent, ideologically inspired actors uh, and uh, and, and, and global criminals. And we see it with the links between you know, Hezbollah and other, other and the IRGC, indeed, into South America, into West Africa, into Australia, and so forth. And that's, that's a major challenge. So the key for government uh, is not to lose focus in all of this. And that's, I'll shut up there because I think I've said enough. Um, in, in, in my experience, you've never quite said enough, uh, JJ. And there's always, there's all, always more to come. Uh, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, uh, it sparks one or two questions, and I'll come back with one or two at the end, as well as uh, those from uh, uh, from our guests. Um, our third speaker, uh, who has uh, a particular uh, UK-based role because of his experience and uh, and interests, is former member of Parliament, uh, member of the House of Commons, John Wilcock, but a current parliamentarian as Lord Walney. Um, John, uh, what do you make of? where we are in this difficult period and where extremism has gone, you know, not only abroad, but often state, particularly, uh, particularly domestically, where it's uh, always lurking under the surface. What do you make of it? Yeah, thank, thanks, Alistair. Um, thanks for that introduction. It's really good to see you again. And I mean, you, um, you, you were pretty much universally um, one of the absolute, the absolute most respected um, ministers um, from my former colleagues in the Labour Party right across you. And so um, I, I was really pleased when I saw you uh, having having left the Commons be taking up this role for the MF Society. It's a great appointment for, for them. And thank you for, for having, um, having me on. Um, it is uh, something of a challenge to follow um, Sir John, given his preeminence in the subject, but on this particular focus of the um, of the domestic uh, the do the domestic element and how uh, and how COVID is likely to affect this and where it's to go from here. I mean, I think it's important to 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 state that you can you can both. It's very easy both to understate and overstate the importance. I think of potentially of the pandemic to the ongoing threat of extremism. Because on the on the one hand, you've had uh, a, a political media uh, narrative, well, the whole the, the the focus of the country being on. Um, a, a relatively narrow set of how do we get how do we get the recovery how do we get vaccines back to the detriment of uh, sometimes looking at the issues of extremism. On the other hand, there is a um, there can be a, a blanket assumption that um, everyone is is uh, is at home online um, and and therefore. Um, the problems of extremism are therefore bound to get worse, and that is a it, that is clearly a, a, a credible issue, and it's one that I, that it's it's really important for us to to continue to um, to explore. Um, but it, uh, it it shouldn't preclude the the idea that actually um, in in a number of key ways uh, some of the organisations. Uh, have had it have, have had it more difficult to uh, extremist organisations have had it more difficult to recruit and I've had it focus and I've had some of the same issues of um, uh, uh, logistical is issues from being stuck inside that uh, else that everyone else has um, on. Um, a few. Uh, a few comments on two separate issues that the, the pandemic throws up, one on physical, the, the physical geographical element, and two on, and second on the, the narratives and information space and 
and um, the great potential uh, for disinformation. I mean, on the physical element, uh, Sir John was talking about how uh, Daesh is weaker uh, than it was um, largely thanks to the efforts that um, the uh, Coalition of Nations Against It has put in place. I, I, that, that is clearly true, but I, I was, I thought, although it was notable what the UN uh, had pointed out that actually um, the uh, uh, the, the, the comparative restrictions on um, uh, on nation states and their agencies um, uh, put in place by COVID uh, compared to the way that the um, uh, jihadis were, were operating um, has created a difficulty over the last 12 months. And I think if you are looking forward at this, when you talk about where our focus is going to be, um, there's been a danger over the last 12 months that, that that focus has not, not been on, on obviously, um, I think that is potentially far greater in uh, the years ahead where the the huge resource pressure that every individual country comes under recovery and, uh, and have to face multilateral agencies that actually the level of will as well focus challenged in a way where we absolutely are going to need it to some areas to prevent them once again becoming the kind of um, to a level of weakness that is um, that uh, that uh, allows an, uh, an entity such as an entity so that such as Daesh to, to flourish and even and below that even even if you're not getting back to the idea of, of state creation by um, um, by extremist counter-terror groups. But on the, um, the one of the other, the other main area, one of the other main areas that I'm really interested in, in the review that I'm doing for the government is on, uh, is on disinformation. And um, it's, Sir John was right, I think, to, to to give the note of scepticism about the uh, uh, about the rise of the uh, about the rise of the far right, um, correct in so much as um, I think there really, there can really be a tendency uh, to um, that when when uh, colleagues in the in in the Met when government colleagues when people say the far right is the fastest growing. Uh, area, they'll say they'll say things which are correct, but what is heard then is actually that this issue is on a parallel um, with the Islamist threat, um, which is absolutely demonstrably not the case. And my review uh, is is to look at political violence on the far right and the potential for um, uh, subversions and violence and and criminality on on the far left as well. And it's and it uh, in my my new brief is not to look specifically at the ongoing threat of Islamism, but it's really important for for me. It will be in the final report that I produce to to make sure that actually that you can anchor that against um, the where the Islamist threat remains, because otherwise I think you can end up skewing. The conversation on extremism end up skewing resources and focus in a way which could be deeply harmful domestically in um, uh, in the coming months and, and years. But the but we have had uh, in the states, as as Sir John mentioned, um, a uh, uh, an attack, um, organised uh, organised violence, criminality within uh, on. Capitol Hill in the States, which you know, our um, intelligence enforcement agencies here are clear would have would have met the uh, in, in parts would have met the counter terror would have met the terrorism threshold. And that did emanate from um, a particular um, particular far um, well it had elements within it of um, of the far right. Now, the, the thing which which I'm one of the things I'm looking at is is the it is really striking the way in which uh, that largely completely false narrative 
uh, which was fueling a lot of, uh, which was fueled what culminated in the January the 6th um, violence and the storming of the Capitol. I think it, need, it, 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 is, it is time for us to look again at, at, at how that level of disinformation campaign was allowed, was, was able to run as virulently as it did um, and, and what within the complex levers that a, a liberal democracy like the UK and the US have, what are the levers which are acceptable for a, a democracy like the UK to pull in similar circumstances and what is going to be, what's going to be effective. Now, when, when the, this time last year, when the pandemic was, was, um, was emerging, um, there was all there was a lot of speculation of you know how disinformation campaigns on the vaccine are going to are going to work now clearly they do exist but I think one reason one thing uh, that can actually give us a level of optimism certainly within the UK is just actually how successful the UK has been in uh, having its populations its population take up the vaccine. And while there is clearly a level of, of vaccine scepticism uh, within areas of the population, some more than others, and, why, and where there are organised campaigns to fuel disinformation over the vaccine. I mean, it is, a, it is an extraordinary thing that, um, that vaccine take-up has far exceeded any of the official um, uh, the official estimates and and previous uh, examples, um, which is which is a reason to be to be optimistic about the ability um, to uh, to actually um, uh, have a have a level of rational discourse which can be listened to, but. Um, but Alistair um, refers to my personal experience of extremism, and um, and, and I mean I should be I should try to be careful in the language in the way that I, I talk about this in uh, in my experience within the Labour Party before I, I left it. But I but I was um, it, it, while it's it sort of it would be easy and wrong to make to make glib comparisons between what happened in. Um, uh, uh, in, in, in the US, in Washington, um, and some of the, uh, the, the disinformation tactics of, um, uh, of the forces that took over the Labour Party. I, I, I'm, I, I'm struck by a, um, uh, by a poll that was taken while I was still a member of the Labour Party, which suggested that 50% um, that of Labour Party members at a particular time, when Jeremy Corbyn was its leader, 50% said the only source of news which they trusted was Jeremy Corbyn himself. You know, not The Guardian, not a Labour Party. It, it was him himself, of which, which I think, um, we, I mean, and thankfully the Labour Party has proved me wrong and this is rejecting Corbynism and it's got much better leader, but it, it shows actually how, how vulnerable even mature, mature democracies like uh, our own can be to a level of disinformation which can quite quickly I think shift people's sense of what is acceptable and what it isn't and I think there is there is a relationship between the way in which um, the madness within the Labour Party and the fact that the Labour Party was found to have been acting illegally um, by the uh, equality uh, Christian or human rights um, in regard to its its um, uh, treatment of Jewish members and anti-Semitism, and so that is it, so the disinformation space is a really important area where it's going uh, where I think uh, I'm focusing on in the report and it's going to be important for um, for years to come. Just to find uh, to just to conclude on that, I was within I think 48 hours of being able to visit um, Hadea. Uh, in the in the Emirates back in March before the um, uh, before the restrictions came in and we decided to probably I mean I literally was at the point of um, uh, of booking into the flight and I'm possible that I would still be there now had I um, uh, had I had I um, taken an, a a, um, a different route but I think the 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 
the, the partnership, I'm hoping to, to um, take that back up again as things relax, but the partnership that the UK has with uh, the Emirates in, uh, in particular on these issues is, is hugely important now. It's going to be increasingly, uh, increasingly important in, in, in the future. You look at the debate over the PREVENT programme here and the review that we had as just a microcosm of the way in which orga organised Islamist um, misinformation and, proper, and propaganda um, is, uh, it, it could, could really damage um, the, the UK's fight against counter extremism and, and terrorism um, going, uh, going forwards. Thanks, Elsa. Uh, thanks, John, very much indeed. Thank you for your kind words at the beginning and thank you for your, uh, uh, your uh, exposition. And uh, a number of interesting things coming up, some pretty fascinating and, uh, and different conversations, but I, I wanted to try and bring them all together by using the first question we've had from uh, uh, you know, our longtime friend uh, 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 Bashir Bernard uh, Simon, um, and asked the question about uh, about lockdown. Uh, and Bashir asks, one of my concerns regarding the growth in extremism under COVID is that lockdown conditions may present fertile grounds for the radicalization of youth with too much time on their hands online. Is that the case in your view? And if so, how best to counter this threat? And that I think goes to disinformation. Uh, people with more time to spend on, on their, uh, with more time on their hands to spend online may be increasingly attracted to those sources of news. And mm -hmm. I found the uh, the comparison of what uh, uh, Lord Walney was saying uh, about the reliance on Jeremy Corbyn, of course, mirrored very much in the United States, where people's belief in Trump as an individual uh, is outstripping other sources of information and is quite concerning. The other side to lockdown that some have mentioned, of course, is that because of the, um, the circumstances, it does give societies an opportunity for greater surveillance uh, of their people, because you've got to know where people are. Some of the objections to test and trace at the beginning were, were based around this. There may be some concerns within different parts of uh, not only UK society, but other societies uh, as well. So could we just examine uh, each of you sort of that lockdown sense? Does it present too much time on people's hands and therefore uh, they they get into uh, they go to, to bad places and that will have been uh, exacerbated during the lockdown but equally has it in some ways given societies a better opportunity to find out where people are and maybe uh, disrupt activities uh, uh, john spoke a little bit about this so perhaps i could ask the other two to speak first um uh, jj do you want to have a crack at that and then your excellency Muted, John. <laughs> there was quite a lot of talk at the beginning of the uh, of the epidemic about about the risks, and and, and you know, if you, if you think back, there were a lot of people talking about um, uh, about conspiracy, you know, theories and, and all sorts of you know, uh, toxic narratives out there. I mean, it has been striking, I think, as uh, as uh, as you said, the take up of the vaccine. Uh, has been very high in this country. I mean, less so actually, interestingly, in France, uh, uh, for various reasons, uh, in Germany. Um, and that suggests to me that people do actually trust, there is a degree of social trust still in this country, uh, which is worth holding on to. But, you know, at the heart of this is this question of trust and of fake news. You, know, you talk about the extraordinary approval levels he has, and when he talks about something, you know, when, when the, the number of, of, of Republicans who believe that the election was stolen um, is, is extraordinarily high, simply because Trump says so. And I think that's a reflection of something much broader uh, in society, uh, the way in which, uh, in which we have lost, we are losing trust in, in news. You see, and you, some of this is to do with the way with, with newspaper journalists themselves behave. I mean, they have increasingly become activists rather than, rather than reporters. And I think that is seriously dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous for all sorts of reasons. I mean, not just because of radicalization or extremism, but because of, if, you, if, if trust breaks down, social cohesion breaks down. Um, and for me, that, that's a long-term trend. What you do about it, I don't know. I simply don't know. It is, it, is, it is so powerful out there. But I think that's the longer term. I don't think that's specifically to do with the pandemic or with COVID. Um, it's something that's, that's, that's been happening. It's, been, it's a storm that's been gathering for years. Um, uh, and it's now here. Uh, 
that your excellency that sense of lockdown giving people too much time on their hands to explore the wrong things but has it enabled societies just to perhaps disrupt uh, illicit activities more than they might have done uh, I think, you know, that at least what we can see in the Emirates is that there is a, a greater capacity for the government to follow us around. Um, you know, we have uh, we have an app that uh, we have to um, upload, well, rather uh, all of our test results uh, for COVID are uploaded. And when we move between Emirates, you know, they need to know um, there are kind of formal border controls now between certain Emirates. Um, so I think, you know, that's, I, I don't know for a fact whether state security is using this, but, uh, you know, I assume that there will be some interest. Uh, I think uh, just from my own personal experience in lockdown, um, you know, we, we have a fairly large house with a garden, uh, and I felt like I was in a pressure cooker, uh, and there was no way of getting away from my, uh, my family. Um, so I just, I just wonder... You know, um, uh, less privileged people than I, uh, um, and how they how they face lockdown. Um, uh, there's got to be something uh, there. Uh, one thing that we have noticed in the Emirates, and that the government again is is working very um, uh, intense intensively on, uh, is the situation of the mental health of people in lockdown. So not necessarily related to you know sort of terrorism or extremism, but you know how people are actually coping with with lockdown. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the issue of mental health, as, as uh, John Jenkins knows, in the Arab world is a, a, a very taboo subject. And uh, for the first time, I feel, uh, in, at least in my lifetime, we are openly talking about the issues of mental health, um, whether it's depression or anxiety or stress or, or even, you know, sort of the way in which those, uh, those mental states then have physical effects, whether it, it, it becomes sort of uh, um, domestic violence or, or, or abuse. Um, and so it's it's fascinating to see um, the way in which our government and some of our uh, non-government institutions are now beginning to tackle those issues, uh, which I think will have a knock-on effect on uh, situations where people are becoming extremists. We do have very, very stringent laws on what you can uh, say online. Um, and there have been certain cases which, you know, have, have, have kind of tested the limits of the law, I think. Um, but it's, we are very, very careful that we maintain some kind of social peace online, um, whether it's on Instagram or social media, Twitter, and so on. Um, and you know, people are very aware of how they, how they describe the world or how they uh, report on things happening in the Emirates. Um, and there is a big focus on accurate reporting, even if it's in a private capacity. You're, you, that there is a limit to um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the imagination. Um, you cannot imagine things and you cannot um, go out there and start provoking people into, into believing different things if it's not true. Um, so perhaps, you know, there's something there um, that uh, other countries might want to look at. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I want to sort of stay with a, a religious theme and, and, and take a question in relation to that. Sabani Whitespunner, former Le well, Lieutenant General uh, Sabani Whitespunner, um, says to us, uh, a question for Lord Walney and uh, His Excellency the Minister, and I'll ask John to answer first, if I may. Several politicians have highlighted the need in their constituencies for stronger, moderate Islamic guidance in the UK. They say the Muslim Council does not provide this. And recently here we had the interesting experience of the new leader of the uh, uh, Muslim Council for, uh, for Great Britain being very sharply cross-questioned on Women's Hour by Emma Barnett and a very strong reaction to that. Um, but he says, uh, they say the Muslim Council does not provide this and that both young Muslims and those who teach and mentor them do not have anyone to turn to to apply Islam to life in contemporary Britain, unlike other major religions who do. Can the UAE help the UK in suggesting how this might be addressed? So, uh, John, what's, John uh, Woodcock, what's your experience of, of this? Is that a fair challenge? And then I'd ask uh, Omar Gabash, who has a particular interest, particularly in uh, in tutoring young Muslims, what he makes of that? Mm. Um, I think it is a really um, important and, 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 and difficult issue and one in which actually I think um, we have suffered from, um, uh, from politicians and others actually finding this too difficult uh, to, to talk about in the, in the UK for... Um, uh, for a number of years and creating something of a vacuum which has allowed a sense that, that um, people who have legitimate concerns about the, uh, 
the MCB, about um, uh, other um, uh, other avowedly Islamist organisations operating within the UK have nevertheless not, not properly articulated why those concerns are and have allowed um, others, few, but fueled by those Islamist organisations, to create to put out a, a, a false sense that actually this is just about getting at Muslims. Um, and you have seen that, I think, in the reaction to William Shawcross, as um, who were, I think will, will be an incredibly well-qualified re reviewer of the prevent strategy. Um, you are also seeing it in the ongoing debate over the, um, uh, the definition of, of Islamophobia, um, which is a live issue within government, within local, within, uh, local authorities. Um, and actually you've had, uh, you have a number of, of uh, politicians who, who we could talk about perhaps in, in another forum name, uh, who, who are generally on the right side of, of, of many of these arguments, who, who feel it's, oh, it's just too difficult and I don't want to be accused of um, being against Muslims in general and therefore I'm going to um, uh, mute my criticism of organisations who are doing, um, uh, leading things in the wrong direction. But there is not an alternative. It's not for me, obvious, for obvious reasons to say what the alternative should be or, or necessarily be part of put, putting it together. But it, but it is a real problem. We should be more open in, in, um, in talking about it. Um, uh, Your Excellency, I mean, this, this, this the question of, of moderate Muslim leadership or however that is defined uh, is an issue not just in the UK, but elsewhere. And uh, Hookie Walker, uh, our former ambassador in the UAE and the great friend of the Emirates Society follows up the question by, by linking it to vaccine disinformation and how some religious leaders have been involved in the effort to try and persuade those who have been reluctant to take vaccines from a religious point of view that actually there's no basis uh, for that. Yeah. Um, is, is that an issue you see in other parts of, of the world and uh, is, this a con is this an unfair criticism of Islamic teaching or does it still have a very strong basis? Yeah, you, complicated question. Um, the, I think the, the way in which we approach um, religion and life in the, in the Emirates is, is, is quite different from the way in which the question kind of presents it. Um, we uh, having very, very strong secular kind of leadership, by which I mean uh, the leadership of, you know, the, the ruling family, the crown prince, the prime minister uh, of the Emirates, uh, the ruler of Dubai, um, they have such a powerful presence in people's lives that it becomes very, very difficult to listen to um, self-appointed Muslim uh, spokespeople who want to push a certain agenda. Um, and so we, we, we're living in a society where we've got leadership with the ability to make change, with the ability to present a, uh, a positive view of life and an ability to actually provide these opportunities and, and, and to empower um, people. Um, that we, are, in fact, you know, it, these extremist voices are, are kind of drowned out in, in a wealth of opportunity uh, and a wealth of challenges um, in, in the world in which we live. Uh, we do um, also um, know that we can directly intervene in the way in which our religious leaders are trained uh, and that those are choices that we as a society can make. Um, often, uh, we, we're, we're in the past at least, we were, always, you know, we were given the impression that uh, a Muslim spokesman represents what is called true Islam uh, and that there is this idea that true Islam exists somewhere and he's the one who can define it for us. Um, what we noticed also was that often these people are making it up as they go along anyway, uh, and they are using this position of authority, self-appointed um, uh, uh, authority or self-granted authority uh, to make decisions for people. As long as people are going to start, you know, uh, as long as young people are going to be looking for that kind of guidance, we, we run the risk uh, of, of having them fall into those narratives. Um, and again, I say we, with our uh, secular leadership, um, we're, we're able to push back against um, that, that current uh, or those currents and those people 
Um, and we just like, we, we, we provide a broader a set of opportunities for people to, to do other things. I'm not sure that um, we would have much to uh, advise um, British Muslims on, uh, other than, you know, the, the example that we give. Um, there is no, um, there's no specific guidance on how to live in the modern world, other than to live in the modern world and get on with things. Yeah, I, I would just, just say very briefly, Alice, um, that I think the example and the leadership that the uh, UAE has been showing on this, and particularly through the, the, the Forum for Promoting Peace, which I've had the uh, privilege of yeah. Yeah. bringing together uh, faith in, in uh, involving the Anglican uh, Church here, um, it may it makes a real uh, difference on uh, uh, on this, and in, and we should maybe think of ways in which we can we can reflect that uh, into the UK uh, to an even greater level. Thanks, JJ. Yeah, very quickly, I mean, this is a debate that's that's particularly heated in France at the moment, of course, uh, with President Macron's uh, um, uh, proposals uh, for various things, including a charter. Uh, uh, he's trying to get uh, uh, imams in France uh, and their, their, their representative organisations to sign up for this charter, endorsing the public knowledge. And there's been a lot of talk in France about, uh, about having you know, imams who promote a, a, a European Islam or, or whatever you, you, you want to call it. Something's happening in, in Austria as well with, with the Chancellor of Works. You know, I do think that gets it the wrong way around. I mean, one of the one of the ways in which you in which you it, the, one of the ways in which extremist voices are empowered because non-extreme voices are shut down, and you see it. I was reading a, a, a very good piece actually this morning in the Neue Zürich um, Zeit from a, a, a Moroccan um, a Swiss uh, a writer, Kazem uh, um uh, about this very subject, and 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 you see, I mean, there is this extraordinary and weird alliance with some on the left, uh, between Islamists and some on the left, to intimidate and shut down progressive voices. The key is to enable those voices to be heard more clearly. And that, and that function of open debate, uh, I think one of, the, one of the things that we, are, we have witnessed in the West, in particular in recent years, is this closing down a debate. That's the unhealthy thing. Um, perhaps I can pick up on, on that and just, broaden the debate away from the, 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 the pure concentration on Islamic issues by picking up Jim White's question, the great Jim White. Uh, and, and he says this, do you agree that we can learn from history when combating false news? People don't change, but technology does. When cheap printing presses became available, there was an explosion in destabilizing radical political pamphlets. The situation was brought under control by deeming the printers to be publishers with penalties for printing false news. Should social media platforms be treated the same way? Now, a, a, a big debate goes on about that, but is that one way forward? Uh, and would that restriction help or hinder? Um, JJ, do you want to start on that? And then I'll ask other colleagues. I mean, to that, that, that's a huge question. I mean, you know, I, I, I speak as a Catholic, so you can't expect me to, 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 uh, to, to, to welcome the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the turmoil, which that all those, the, the, which, which, the, which the introduction of printing into, into Western Europe and the, and the production of inflammatory. Doesn't, it, doesn't and, it mean you're always right, JJ? And, <laughs> yes, no, okay. and only when I'm speaking ex cathedra. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 um, the explosion of inflammatory Protestant pamphlets um, caused. But you know, you look at this. You look at this, the European 17th century. It was the most violent century in the history of um, in the history of modern Europe. Um, I, you know, I, it, it, it's a social issue, really, and 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 it's you know social. I, I think there are things you can do with social media companies uh, and the rest of it because they are publishers, basically, even though they deny they're not. Um, uh, but it's you know, I just want I just wonder whether it's whether it's whether it's gone too far, because it's not just social media. It, you also see it in the way that universities conduct research these days, you, in the way that newspapers operate and uh, so forth. I mean, I, I, I don't know what to do about that, but it is a huge problem. Mm. Um, uh, Your Excellency and, and, and John, a view on whether we physically tighten the controls on, uh, on social media to make it more difficult for them all to give them greater responsibility for what is put out there. Uh, uh, Your Excellency? I, I was going to uh, hand over the uh, uh, 
the opportunity to answer that question to Lord Walden. Um, <laughs> very wise. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I think uh, we should be watching really closely. I'm trying to watch closely what's happening in Australia uh, on this, um, where um, I think there is a um, there is a particular focus in in Australia on the way in which a um, a, a a potentially hostile, certainly non-aligned uh, state has um, uh, ability to pump disinformation in um, into Australian culture via um, currently so totally unregulated um, means. Um, it, Jim uh, is is right to put the question in the way he does, and and when when you spend time with military colleagues, they find this audible eye rolling at the suggestion that this is, that the idea of disinformation is in any way new. But where I think is it, it is a threat on a new scale and that it is, it is, it is so much more of a challenge now to, um, uh, to regulate the kind of information which people can access. Um, yes, um, the publisher issue is, is, is hugely important, um, but it, even if you took a, uh, even if you made um, social media companies publishers, that's only actually relatively one small part of the, of the forest. And where, where is in the um, information was largely channeled through things like printing presses. Uh, now, I don't think you can put back in the box the um, extraordinary explosion of people's ability uh, to, to get news, or certainly we would not want to um, in a liberal de democratic um, society. And so, it, and so it raises the game in a way which is, makes it much more of a challenge. Excellency, did you want to comment or, or you, we've got one more question. You can come in on that perhaps. I'll, I'll, I'll All right. Okay. Um, we have one. Uh, I have one final <laughs> question before I ask His Excellency the Ambassador to uh, uh, to round us off with a vote of thanks. Um, it's a question from uh, Session uh, Zafar, and I just want to broaden it a little. Um, it's about the theory of grievance, um, and uh, Session says says this. Um, you could argue that Islamism has evolved in the past five years, one that converges far left thought, decolonial critical Muslim studies, and finally activists from the social justice community. The theory of grievance has become an enticing approach for many young impressionable Muslims in the West. Is this an area that policy circles and governments are taking note of? And I would add to that the theory of grievance that is elsewhere. We saw it in the demonstrations in the United States people believing that something had been taken from them. Uh, there is an interesting new film being premiered at the Berlin Film Festival uh, this week, uh, Je suis Carl, uh, which is looking at, at the far right in Europe, using, uh, again, as, as, uh, as Sir John has said, that sense of cancelling and using the ability to close down people, to put long-term people of far right views in places in establishment in order uh, not to uh, uh, not to use people with short cropped hair and violence, but to take over society in a different way using disinformation and the, uh, and the like. And that theory of grievance, which is fed upon in so many different ways. So the theory of grievance, both in Muslim communities and wider communities, as a last comment from each of you, do you, you have a view as to whether is it various societies are now very, very much more susceptible to a sense that if something has gone wrong, it's somebody else's fault and their governments won't do anything about it, but some external force can. Um, Sir John, first of all, and then Your Excellency, and then Lord Walney. Yeah, it's toxic. Um, and uh, in, you know, one of the problems with this, because the Grievance Olympics fit into a sort of, a, a, as, the, as, the, as, the speak, as the question has said, this wider uh, question of the issue of, of, of post-colonialism, subaltern studies, critical. And the problem with all of this, is that there is no way to change. There is no theory of change. I mean, it, it, which, which makes it a cult rather than uh, politics. It makes it faith rather than politics. I mean, you know, like Romy D'Angelo's stuff about, you know, ex investment, you are inevitably racist if you're white, whatever white means. Um, and, and you can't, you can never change, you can never get better, you can only confess. I mean, that is not the basis for any sensible politics 
that I recognize. It's the politics of the of, of the of the iconoclasts in 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 seventh century, um, uh, eighth century Byzantium. It's the politics of the of the of the of the idol smashers in 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 sixteenth and seventeenth century Europe. Um, it's a it's a it's a politics of every cult that has ever existed. But now, because of social media. Uh, it is it is it is it has penetrated our societies to a degree that it never did in the past. You know, when the Anabaptists of Munster took 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 that city over in the, in the 1640s, I mean, they were crushed because they were isolated. I think too many people um, now, believe, and you see this also with the far right. You see it with with the QAnon, uh, incel people, uh, 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 Proud Boys, and so forth. <clears throat> and you know, it's it, it's it's part of this decay of trust, of social trust that we were talking about earlier. That's that's a generational challenge. Yeah, Your Excellency. Um, you know, um, when I when I heard the, the idea of grievance, uh, it made me think of um, our Prime Minister, the ruler of Dubai, who about fifteen years ago he doesn't often make these public statements and he uh, doesn't often address other other countries or other Arab leaders. His, his focus is very much, you know, the internal um, development of the country. Uh, but he made a, a, a very famous kind of um, a speech where he's, he's said to other leaders in the Arab world, if you don't listen to your people, if you don't hear what they're saying, and if you don't respond positively to what they're saying, you're going you're gonna to end up in a, in, a, in a very bad situation. Uh, and then a few years later, we saw the Arab Spring and we saw the pushback against the Arab Spring. Uh, and he understood uh, a, a long time ago um, that people have needs, people have aspirations. And so in that sense, I think we in the Emirates are an incredibly lucky uh, place because we don't have, a, we, we have an understanding of grievance uh, and justify grievance. And then we have an understanding that government and society can actually do something uh, to, to change that situation. Um, and it just, it, it, it really feels that we're, we're um, very, very privileged in that sense, that we have a government that actively engages with its people actively listens to, to, to uh, particularly young people. Um, and you know, so in that context, the, a, a few years ago, we established a, a, a ministry of, for youth um, led by a, a very young minister, um, who I think now is about 26 or 27 years old. Uh, and there's a continual dialogue going on between government and, and young people. Uh, and, and a lot of things are actually being led by younger people these days. So uh, I think that sense of hope, uh, that sense of opportunity, again, I'm sorry, I keep coming back to that. That's, that's really what I'm getting out of all of this. Uh, and, it, and it gives me a great deal of pride to be able to say that. Great, thank you. Uh, Lerone. Um Zeshan puts the question superbly, um, how to respond. Um, what Sir John and um, His Excellency the Minister talk about the erosion of trust is, is indeed the foundation of this. And, and you look at the really spectacular uh, fall in trust in a, a myriad of institutions in uh, going back, going over decades, but also actually in the last 10 years, including very much and very importantly in government, in pol political institutions, in politicians themselves. It's spectacular. It's hugely erosive, um, corrosive, and it is uh, exactly the environment in which other things fill, like the um, the grievance narrative, which uh, Zeshan um, maps get, uh, running right the way along what, uh, many what are otherwise contradictory um, threads. There is obviously no easy answer, but I think um, one thing you know this is. It, um, this is not a government, um, on, I would have many di uh, disagreements um, with, um, with this government, as, as Alistair would know, because he had to listen to me moaning on about a lot of them when he was a, when he was a minister. But, um, but where I think actually they, could be, they should be commended is in saying that, that actually there needs to be a space for challenge of the grievance culture and actually creating a framework for debate and to be able to say that the, the new orthodoxies that have been pushed in a number of critically important spheres of public life and debate have actually come out of, not come out of nowhere, but they've, they have become unassailable totems within the space sometimes of weeks, you know, certainly years, and then actually and that, that mean and, and that should not allow us to 
um, you should not accept the the idea that that all debate about them is no longer valid. And I think we are in danger of slipping into that place. And unless we have got actually the space to to talk about this, you actually you don't you, you don't tackle the 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 erosion of trust and grievance culture by accepting a particular grievance narrative, you have to have the space as a country to be able to debate and challenge it. That's what traditionally the UK it, it has been at its strongest and it's where we, we should aim to be uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, wise words, both of warning, but also some looking ahead and indeed, as far as I was concerned, some answers to some of the challenges that are there that we can already see uh, and should promote. Um, uh, could I now ask uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador uh, of the UAE to the U uh, UK, uh, to offer a vote of thanks to our three distinguished speakers. Thank you, Alistair, for another uh, superb Emirates Society event. It's a very salutary warning against the risks of complacency. Uh, for the past year, we may have been distracted by R rates, vaccines and lockdowns, but extremism is also a type of infection that ru ruins lives wherever it goes. And it's not just the victims of extremist violence that we should remember, it's also the young minds that poison, that have the poison, um, that are poisoned by dangerous, very dangerous ideologies. So I'm really pleased um, about the work the UA and the UK are doing together in this area. And I'm very grateful for all that um, His Excellency Amal Khabash does and Sir John Jenkins and Lord Walney um, in the quality of outstanding people we have and, and the time they dedicate. They devote a great a deal of their time to thinking deeply about these issues uh, and, and working out what can be done to keep our people, people safe. Gentlemen, it's been an absolutely fascinating and deeply reassuring 60 minutes. Uh, and on behalf of the Emirates Society, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador, and thank you very much to colleagues. I'm delighted to say that we record these and make these available to Emirates Society members, so it will have, uh, I would imagine, quite a wide distribution when people hear the quality and the excellence of the comments that we've heard. So, Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. Can I thank uh, not only our panellists, but all those who have attended, some very high-quality colleagues, uh, and say a very warm uh, good afternoon to you all, and look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thank you very much indeed.